Hello everyone, today we talk about organic and administration of 30 years war armies. We have already made some introductory uh, videos on this war. We have, yes, made already a, a battle one as well, but this is paving the way for more in-depth stuff. Other battles, tac general, you know, tactics um, in, in a theoretical way, strategy. We will have really to talk a lot about this work, because again, it, it's really one of my favorites, but uh, I've, nev I've never uh, really well in, in the depth of it, Cons considering on YouTube at least that it, it was made up of several wars, right? One, um, let's say, one aspect that is deeply overlooked about the Thirty Years' War is, is the wars that actually made it up. Right. There was the Polish-Swedish War, the Bohemian War, the Habsburg-Transylvanian one, the Spanish-Dutch, the Palatinate one, the Anglo-Spanish War, the Franco-Habsburg War, the Lower Saxon-Danish War, the French Huguenot Rebellion, Anglo-French War, the War of the Mantua and the Montferrat Succession, the Franco-Savoyard War, the Swedish War, the Russo-Polish War, the Polish-Swedish War, the Franco-Lorraine War, the Franco-Spanish War, the Franco-Swedish War, the English Civil War, the Habsburg-Transylvanian War of later times, in the 40s, uh, the first one in, in, from 1921, the same English Civil War had a lot to do with the, with the 30 uh, years war as such. So it, it's one of those never-ending, you know, pools of, um, of military insight, and I personally love the, the 17th century, both the, the age of the confessional classes and the Grand Siècle. And as you've seen, I've been expanding a bit uh, into early and, and and late modern warfare uh, recently because I need to you know, to offer that point of reference also not just for those who are very passionate uh, about medieval warfare as a medievalist of course you have my heart there but it's um, it, it's again crucial vital to talk about the whole thing and also things in general right so that uh, by organization administration we can look at several different aspects, of course, of, of the war itself, right? Um, say that by the Thirty Years' War, uh, the accepted basic organic element of, of the army was the regiment, right? This would have, in fact, a long history ahead as well, but in, in a sense, this was being worked on, right, through, um, through all the strategic, operational, tactical needs, uh, of the case. Uh, a regiment was composed of a number of companies of 150 to 150 men each, right? There was essentially over a century of tradition behind this practice uh, that dated back to the Spanish colonelas and tercios of um, 1505. We're talking about Gonzalo de Cordova, right? The greatest um, commander in modern military history that created modern warfare as such um, and this this there's organic construction had the to in, in the creation up to 1535 at the latest um, there were the the French legions of Francis the first 1531 I made a video about the French uh, the native French infantry of the Italian wars, because you know that uh, the, the specification is necessary due to the fact that most, the bulk of, of French uh, foot was Swiss, um, mercenary Swiss, uh, and the, um, uh, the, there had been a lot of experimentation already with classical ideas, and so the, the, at least the, the ideal of uh, applicating some Macedonian, Roman, uh, order to the new organic that was evidently developing with the with the enlargement of armies themselves, the centralization of states, the ever bigger forces concentration, and the the new doctrine uh, regarding also the, the spread uh, of uh, of firearms, the the pike and shot combination, uh, etc. Right. So the while the regiment had already affirmed itself by this point, right, as you understand from essentially one, one century, the practical aspects of regimental organization were very different depending on country to country, but actually from army to army, right? And not just 
national army to national army, but within the same armies of a same country, as we will see now. Now, probably the most important work, uh, at least in a theoretical sense, had been done uh, by this point, uh, speaking of influence, for, in, during the Thirty Years' War by Maurice of Orange. Uh, that has been, I made a video about the, the Dutch army of the, um, the Eighty Years' War. I explained a bit what the reforms of Maurice of Nassau Orange consisted practically and there is a lot of uh, hype legitimately for the uh, also for the level of documentation regarding in fact this, this general's ideas their uh, their the, the way they would uh, try to to applicate them in, the, in, in on campaign and how however in fact the, the latter aspect diverges much from the the theoretical insights that could be um, that, uh, that that was legitimately investigated at the time, and there is a bit the sense that a guy arrives and reforms the army because this guy has you know this in-depth knowledge, and that ever since this reform was applicated and everything was standard according to that. Well, um, uh, there is no doubt that at this point, especially Protestant forces were rising uh, in terms of military quality, the Dutch the Swedes of Gustavus Adolphus, and I made a video about him too, to explain this as well, and that they would win their place um, in the in, in modern military history and also on the international uh, scenarios, protagonists, etc. But that the actual reforms that these individuals are traditionally credited for, but the same can be said for most other so-called military reformers in, in history is is very often pure historical notionism, right? First of all, we do not have the actual evidence that these reforms ever existed as such, meaning that these armies were reformed, meaning they were organized on different patterns at some point, but th these patterns were still resenting of dramatic uh, changes, influences, and heterogeneity. Like, it's really normal for any army. There is no such thing like an army in history having ever been equal to another. Not even in contemporary war, there is no such thing, right? Um, and here, not even by approximation, really, that some innovations that these reformers were credited wouldn't kick in sometimes even after generations following uh, this guy's exploit in those national armies. And so, there is a bit of a sort of probably also over overplay of the technological factors, uh, or at least this sort of you know f formalistic idea that if, you know there was a guy who was smarter than the other, the others were dumb to keep on fighting the same way, and that instead, as it always happens, armies always evolve by themselves, right? And then you have every once in a while someone that is not necessarily that someone, but his staff. Uh, or at least what was the equivalent of this at that time, organizers, people that worked behind the scenes um, at many levels in the general political and social system from, uh, from to, to which these armies belonged, that made this, this change more kind of um, efficient or uh, accelerating or, you know, having an impact. But when you actually look at the military history, of these figures, you realize that the reason why they were so military successful wasn't the fact that they fought um, with armies that particularly differed from one of others, but simply that they were pressured by the circumstances, they were very good commanders uh, individually, uh, and that they had a lot of experience, and that basically, just out of sheer practice, by the way, which is very important uh, in warfare, they had created armies that had naturally evolved, right? You can say the adverb naturally is um, to be understood generically. You know, the, the biological metaphor for for military systems is not accurate, uh, as a matter of fact. But still, that evolved to, to that point. You know, they were veteran, refined armies with people with experience and led it, knew how to make it work, uh, and so on. And so they achieved those um, strategic and tactical feats that allowed even entire nations to, you know, to stage, to, to step forward, like uh, to literally be born as an independent ones, uh, such as the Dutch. Uh, think about the Swedish Empire, at least in, you know, in that in that scale. Um, but that do not necessarily have to do precisely with this. So when you find statements like uh, this guy invented seventh century 
warfare. Uh, what the hell does it even mean? <laughs> you know, um, and especially if you look at other armies contemporary, you realize that even though uh, historiography did not concentrate on them, perhaps because you know the historiography of these countries in contemporary times it tended to exalt, for example, the guys from that confession as opposed to the others, etc. You realize that all armies, um, more or less at the same time, were developing in the same ways. And that especially Europeans at this point didn't have much difference with one another, especially in Western Europe. Um, and um, this is pretty self-evident by the, the, the general nature order. You see, there could have not been such radical and absolute and formalistic change at the root of, of say, of the interests of these people at the time. These people had much bigger concerns than, let's say, f just magically changing these armies in a way that would make them win and that n nobody else had, right? It's just, this is uh, fantasy. It's not history, right? It, 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 it's just um, denied by by reality as such. Uh, and, and this should actually, it, it is the best service you can render to these commanders because it means that they didn't have a magic card, magic trick that they, they played uh, so that they could win out of it. It's actually revealing their essential capacities as uni human beings universally and not only, you know, in function of some sort of structuralistic interpretation of these systems, right? Um, there is no doubt that over the period of 1590 to 1609, Maurice of Nassau drastically reorganized the Dutch army. Uh, ideally, again, people say well, it's the Roman model, but of course, uh, Romans didn't fight with pike and shot, and so it's a bit difficult even to try to, to make such comparisons. What actually this Roman inspiration was about was the fact that, of course, the Roman military, as it had developed by uh, at least the, uh, the, the late Republic, was um, a very efficient uh, centralized uniform model right that still we would be you know fascinated by the degree of still of customization personalization uh, in in ancient warfare but that of course was the aim a bit of these emerging states in the process of centralization and so the surpassing of a sort of feudal um, system it was more heterogeneous created first and foremost a political problem Right, the the need of uniformity wasn't merely a mechanical need on on the field, but also just a way to to access these forces, right, politically, and to use them uh, more speedily, more readily, um, and effectively. So to, to to functionalize the entire system, there were offices, there were uh, functions that nobody up to this point had really um, standardized. You you would think that I don't know something so obvious, like logistics, had not been standardized until, I don't know, the, 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 the second half of the 17th century. In France, they, since the, the French army was also uh, expanding dramatically, at some point there were two guys that, that sit at a table and began to say, okay, we have to pre-orderly provide for supplies in, in a way that they match the quantity of troops that um, will take the field. And this has a lot to do with standardization because you must just know how many troops, first of all, you will have there and you have to pre-organize this. But nobody had ever done it before. Why? Because they were dumb? No, because essentially the system had worked without the expense of creating this office um, uh, and essentially would go by the good enough that in warfare is a bit like the, the golden section all right, and things would have worked like that. It's evident that at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, the needs of um, speeding up this process, given the enlargement of certain great powers, in that case with Dutch, uh, the, the Spanish uh, control, government of their country, uh, and so the, the, the terrible might that could be poured uh, on these uh, independentists was something that they had to cope with adequate means. Right, and so uh, when we look at Nassau's standardization in the size and number of companies in each regiment, 
the division of the regiment into a number of battalions or squadrons, which were intended to be the basis of revisions in tactics. You, you realize that this was, yes, what, what on paper they, they envisaged, but that was never actually and fully achieved, um, first of all, in practice, because units would always dramatically be under strength for any army here, uh, without any exception. Right, so the important was just a bit not spoiling like the initial standardization. It's a bit like uniforms. After a few, a couple of months, you literally do not have a uniform to be physically called as such. But the the first shot is important as well uh, in in warfare, especially when you have to just give that first bond. And everything works in in that direction. It's a bit like Gustavus Adolphus uh, Brigade. The, as, as a concept was at least introduced in a more tactical, operational sense. Uh, during the Thirty Years' War, most Protestant armies and, and the French that were quite on, on the fore by themselves, so that's the, the commonality here, profited from such uh, developments. Right? These were all forces that were rising, dramatically either because again they were literally fighting for survival like the Dutch or they had huge ambitions paid by foreign powers like Sweden or France that was essentially to become soon the hegemonic power in Europe all had this quite stringent uh, military need uh, and profited from such developments because it's just in the rational order of things the Spanish, who earlier had possessed something similar already to Maurice's battalions in their colonelas, had long since abandoned these, thereby making their formation the Tercio relatively clumsy by comparison. And the reason being that the Spanish had an overwhelming power by themselves, so they essentially wouldn't have, first of all, just like any, the, the largest armies in the world, uh, in the world are uh, less um, refined in, uh, in, uh, in detail, let's say, because the, the bigger challenge there is having such massive amount of armored forces functional and available, right? The, the Spanish, as we'll see now, were, were quite rich also. They could just, again, pour these forces in. Um, and the, um, the the sense of this massive bulk of you know of, of pikes that worked even as again slowly clumsily but still so compact that it was difficult to take on still for most of the Thirty Years' War was still a thing, right? Um, and so hence the the difference. Now, regardless of nationality. Organization within the infantry was remarkably similar, and we can make a comparison here between the Swedish regiment and the Spanish Tercio. The Swedish regiment would count something like between 1200 and 1800 men, in turn um, split in three battalions slash brigades of 600 men, supported by artillery, right? Battalions, each of which comprising four companies. So we're talking about essentially 600 men for the battalion and 150 for the companies. That in turn was uh, split in four uh, platoons of uh, pikemen and four of, of shot, right? Uh, when you look at the, the Spanish Tercio, you have 3,000 men in the regiment. You can argue the Tercios were regiments as such. Um, in uh, 12 companies, so without this other flexible structure, like, uh, in fact, the battalion slash brigade in the Swedish one that is also supported, by the way, as, as an in, uh, by an independent uh, uh, artillery unit of uh, a uh, of um, two per five pounders, and this is commanded by the same regiment commander, right? So it can be associated to the various battalions slash brigades on, on the occasion. Uh, 
the Spanish Tercio has a lonely uh, um, platoon of musketeers that is commanded by uh, actually the same regiment uh, commander and each company is of again f four uh, platoons of of shot right and uh, five of uh, pike as you understand each third your company was made up of 250 men um, so also the the difference especially in the number of pikes in the the, the Swedish army had less um, than than the Spanish the regard at the platoon level uh, in each unit is, is is important and you understand how the say that the Spanish organic was somehow more uh, centralized revolt around the say the the unitary work of of the structure as such whereas the Swedish regiment could be uh, separated uh, into some more active to more active units that could be also supported specifically by a, an artillery unit like ad hoc this is just a, um, a sketch, right? It doesn't mean that everything worked essentially for the Spanish or the Swedes like this on the battlefield. Again, most of these forces were normally under strength, so the way also they would combine each other um, could generate different uh, different units uh, at a time, a dock. So everything really depends on the, the circumstances that you must always taking consideration without thinking that okay there was the standard or organic system no right as we know from pike and shot there were two fundamental types of infantry the pikemen on the one hand the musketeers slash arquebusiers on the other so most armies by the thirty years war preferred uh, especially at the beginning, an equal proportion of the two types, right? The tendency, especially on the field, was in favor of the shot. And you could be surprised to know that in many instances, Gustavus Adolfus Swedes actually reversed the trend of a century because, of course, the pikes, the halberds, etc. had been reduced uh, in, uh, in proportion to the shot right the reason being here not actually a regression in terms of firepower right uh the swedes at some point had this this ratio altered to three to two right? in terms of pipe to shot because of other because of, of the function of uh say because of, of of the tactics that now gustavus relied principally on right so uh, let's put it in this way, and this is quite beneficial to make you understand how all those questions that pour like rain under uh, the videos of, I don't know, himaists or, or reenactors, whatever, they, they, they ask them, oh my god, what, what does happen if a guy all equipped with these forces, well, with these weapons, um, you know, fight against another group of guys all equipped with these weapons, who's going to win? Aside from the sheer stupidity of an incapacity and understanding, of course, war is uh, going to adapt to a certain circumstance uh, for which, if there is such a great disadvantage, things are going to be gapped quite soon in a way or another. And so this, 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 is not, this isn't anything. This is not war. This is not humanity. This is not reality. This is just the delirium of uh, radically underschooled people. But... The the point here is that you can have units that, in virtue of their higher training, are capable of performing a much more aggressive role. They they actually operate uh, in combined arms uh, tactics. Uh, that is to say, this this idea that would fully maximize later on in linear tactics that you must have cavalry, infantry, and artillery all operating very close to one another, supporting each other firepower could be carried out by smaller units that thus were somehow more exposed to enemy uh, to in 
in in at least in the expectation of the possibility of course of being pushed back because they were smaller right and namely in this context of the Swedes harassing for example bulkier formation like the one of the Catholics that mostly followed the tertio system um, so that that um, compactness of forces that eventually could not be reached without heavy infantry and so just by the shot um, could allow such um, such forces properly to rally around some heavier amount of troops that could that sense give the security right to operate more um, more safely in spite of the fact that we're out there that we're sometimes outnumbered but they we're operating this is the point exploiting the uh, the asymmetry that their greater maneuverability affo sometimes afforded them this more than the enemy so for example attacking from from the flank uh, or the rear even in the best um, of opportunities right and this um, higher uh, a, a ratio of pikes had also to do with the fact that the same Swedes had famously enough brought back um, in a most decisive way cavalry uh, compared to what had, had already been happening f from the end of the 16th century when um, cavalry was reacquiring tanks essentially to the weakening of the pike on the field because of the increasing of the shot it's greater capacity you know that by the 18th century this process would have brought the pike basically to be abandoned in uh, tactical uh, you know units so the um, uh, the the idea is that uh, the punch right the idea that, uh, that by some degree the the, the cavalry shock uh, charge factor required especially for smaller units this higher degree of of pikemen the swedes had um in, in part in realized this that the versatility of, of the potential of cavalry that to some point had remained unexpressed or at least there had been uh, almost a, a psychological um let's say a uh, lack of, of trust in it because of the fact that it had been brought down um, in the previous century, etc. Uh, and that could, however, happen naturally, not because, again, others were stupid, but because of the higher training that the Swedes had for, for reasons that had to do just with the way their their army was essentially rebuilt, in part from scratch, was strongly subsidized from France, etc. So also for reasons that couldn't quite be invented because somebody was strangely better than the other of course swedish moral superiority in this sense is important because it was a fresh young aggressive nation that uh, definitely played quite uh, offensively and, and smart and um affirmatively we can say uh during the war and uh as such right uh required uh some uh, on on the field some tactical proportions that had to be adapted to that right so the Swedes had experimented the power of cavalry charges in the in their wars against Poland that still relied on essentially a media an anachronism of success the so-called uh, winged uh, hussars that um, on some occasions had been able to charge frontally naturally with adequate you know precautions softening the enemy up or a whole, uh, attacking from from the side the um the very western the, the swedish pikemen that frontally had been created exactly to stop cavalry rendering it as we were saying that practically in, in that uh, muscle to muscle directly in open field large formation practically in largely ineffective um and the had uh, spears were even longer than the same uh, uh, f foot pikemen, and that in in the right occasions would smash into the uh, Swedish lines, right? And always remember this: that doesn't matter how effective the infantry was at some point historically, but cavalry was always meant to smash even into a pike wall, right? The, the notion that for some reason you have again schisser paper uh, and uh, and and stone punch whatever, um, it's um. Uh, it, it always works. Uh, it, it's BS. That must be calibrated, right? The, the pike was always used throughout since prehistory.
in every army against cavalry because surprise surprise it's literally the only weapon that actually stops cavalry so that's the uh, the thing that you cannot do without but throughout the, the entire middle ages essentially until in fact that the pike square formation had a much greater training not any collectively by the way because actually the the the, the pike fence in in, in uh, within the formation it was extremely primitive and uh, say imprecise let's say unsophisticated and refined um, cavalry regularly smashed into pikemen's ranks and, and broke down this as long as cavalry was decisive which um, and and it, and in this sense uh, and challenged on, on the battlefields with which lasted actually just a couple of centuries throughout the entire middle ages right in the others it was the upper arm but it could still be blocked by this kind of of pike wool but th this is the point it's not the pike wool in itself that matters. What matters is who, is, who makes up that pike wall, how strong they are, how collectively trained they are, how determined they are, how angry they are, how much they want to kill the person in front of them. This is what actually matters in war, right? Moral forces above anything else and any other kind of uh, distraction, technologistically, positivistically, materialistically, deterministically, etc., is mere BS. doesn't have any value whatsoever. Right, it's all something subordinated to moral forces. Ask all the, you know, those medieval knights would literally smash into this pike wall because because they would break, and there is not a way to make war without bloodshed and without risking your life and actually dying at some point, in likely, right, in certain circumstances. But still, right, what you need is is that punching force, and here, of course, the Swedes of Gustavus Adolphus uh, fielded um, this this important um, cavalry uh, that, as we'll see now, was organizationally, um, in fact, reordered uh, from Gustavus by Gustavus' fertile imagination, somebody else's, for that matter, how for how it was eventually to, to take form in the field itself. In fact, throughout the Thirty Years' War, the cavalry in most armies was organized in nothing larger than companies. Right. Uh, operationally, a number of companies could be grouped to form a regiment at times, but the higher organization had no permanence up to this point. So it's, it's the same thing we were saying before, that the Swedes were the first to break this pattern uh, for in a in a consistent fashion among the reforms introduced by Gustavus Adolphus was the standardized cavalry regiment, which he used as a basis for a major change in in tactics during the war. Right, uh, the Dutch and English armies soon followed the same course, but um, the French and Spanish actually remained without this standard cavalry organization higher than the company for for the entire war, in part still because they had uh, good infantry and larger amount of infantry. And again, the, the same thing we were pointing out before. They weren't acting in refined ways with what they had um, to, to save just for reasons that were evidently not as pressuring in relative terms as much as the one of these other, um, of these other nationalities. Um, and, and this tells you what, what did happen, right? Is there a radical change? Is there a revolution? Whatever. No, they just basically uh, were able to enforce a, it with varying degree among these countries, by the way, and the best were the Swedes, this greater control on larger types of cavalry. Right? But why? Because they had designed a, uh, a doctrine that required cavalry to act in a more compact, way right so tactics that again were rendered more it's it, say were rendered inactable in the first place by the higher say collective training of the entire system that would require cavalry to punch en masse at a given point right instead then say um, annoying the enemy with smaller units that would thus create a sort of more gradual attrition right so this this is something that is squaring punching refining the, the battlefield, organics, etc. And, and the future of, of European warfare is this one. Right? So again, there are countries that arrived there first, 
that do not even necessarily enforce this throughout. Again, after the death of Gustavus Adolphus, you don't have uh, all of this stuff surviving ipso facto because, you know, the, the Swedish Army of the Thirty Years' War was the Swedish Army of the Thirty Years' War. Then you had new units, yes, that was or were organized in this way, etc., but it was also about the quality, right, the capacity of enacting this kind of tactics. And we see there is a divide between what was on paper again and what was on the field. Namely, an increase again in shot compared to pike, even according to these, um, say, more theoretical uh, realizations, right? And very often we're not exactly told how everything worked on the field because this was again just a sort of pre preemptive. Uh, it's organic, right? It doesn't mean that uh, this informs per se what is going to happen on the battlefield to core, right? It's the, actually the other way around. What's going to happen on the battlefield is what made you structure the these units in this way because you want to achieve actually more mobility. You want to adapt to something um, m more complicated that, and so that, that um, in order to have more options through this more versatile units that, again, are also not, for example, I mean, the Swedish army is important, but it's it, it's something that enters in war every once in a while in a certain way. Just think about being, I don't know, France and the amount of troops that you have to, to just move, like, uh, the, the Swedes never had 100,000 soldiers at this point. And so you have to reason, you have also to economize on this refinement if you are a larger power, and so not actually the the weaker one right so this is always relative to the context of course as we were comparing before between the spanish and swedish uh, regiment organic gustavus adolfus also made another significant organizational contribution to his own uh, forces by establishing the first proper artillery formation i do think what what's new about Right. Uh, well, again, essentially an autonomous employment of artillery from a tactical point of view. Essentially a regiment of six companies, four composed of gunners and two of pioneers and sappers. It was a major innovation, as in most armies the artillery was merely a collection of guns, and it virtually uh, all... It was, at least partially, in the hands of civilian contractors rather than disciplined soldiers. The Spanish contractors, for example, probably got the best deal getting paid each time they literally moved the guns. Right? You, know, you need to move the guns to a place, to, to a field, to a fort. These guys were paid every time. And, and they were civilians. They, they were specialists and professionals in their own regard, but they weren't soldiers. And that difference is all, right? Remember that this time, the, the, the Thirty Years' War is a bit the watershed also in terms of the concept that there is an actual military separated from the rest of the, uh, the population, the civilians, right? Before this time, you still live in a much less categorical um, society regarding this right and only some countries are developing this sort of uh, functionalization this sort of specialization um, so and this by the way goes far towards explaining why the Swedish artillery rapidly became the finest in the world right in our words they had skilled personnel who would be attached just to a, a regiment so a larger unit that of course, worked all together, having a common goal, a, co a common uh, an esprit de corps, naturally, but also just entering in synthony in, in the maneuvers, knowing each other, etc. Just feeling the pride, part of that unit, um, and intervening ad hoc, right, a as an autonomous body to support this or that subunit on the field, right. Needless to say, of course, you needed very tri a trained, skilled personnel as military, because a civilian can just move the uh, 
artillery somewhere. Occasionally, you would see these guys even picking up arms themselves, etc. But the uh, in, in emergential situations, but having a personnel that is specifically trained even for for that circumstance, also coming closer to the enemy on a regular basis, etc. I mean, these are just crewmen fundamentally; they're not meant to be. Uh, they're not much of an effect in fighting force, but knowing how to operate the guns under fire with you know the enemy close, because as it often happened, because distances here, especially also for the effect of uh, say the the, the, the projectile, the uh, the distances, etc., were often very close to the enemy, right? And especially again in the Swedish army, in which you had this quite synergic cooperation of. Uh, cavalry, infantry, and artillery that often was just uh, behind cavalry men and supported by infantry had to fire when the, the units opened like or with a very good timing right? and so with also deadly effect a close range against more thickly packed and less, as we've seen wieldy um, agile formations of the field right? this requires a great work so all these developments, uh, even those as well established and as this standardized regiment, did not filter through the more backward areas of Europe. For example, both Saxony and Brandenburg for, uh, relied mostly on the on the feudal levy for their military manpower. Right? This is this is fascinating. I mean, Sweden was uh, arguably even a more primitive country. The northern Germany, but as we've seen, its political uh, alignment, uh, interests, etc., had brought a lot of French money into the country. They they just had particular uh, situations. But when you look at, of course, even northern Germany, eastern Germany, this is not like uh, in the south, right? They are somehow backwards. Um, they really rely on a much less standardized force. That at some point it's also somehow mm, quite brutal, right? But not quite collectively trained like other other forces, right? The more you go east, also is, is evident, right? Remember before the uh, the Polish oligarchs with their with their hussars, right? In a still sort of medieval fashion. If you go further east, you, you find this stuff almost up to the time of uh, Peter the Great. Um, so the sense that um, the, uh, the the adequacy to the most updated and most intense battlefields in Western Europe is is a necessity for those that, of course, are also uh, more uh, more pressured by this, right? Uh, what troops were Saxony and Brandenburg able to master were grouped into essentially ad hoc regiments. And on the battlefield itself, which skipped basically a lot of, uh, again, collective training, general connection between these troops, uh, lack of esprit de corps. Um, yes, it was common allegiance to the coast, depending on, on the situation, but everything was based, in fact, on the single nobleman who had brought the retinues and so on, right? So coupled with the other shortcomings of, of these armies, it's not surprising that disaster plagued both Saxony and Brandenburg uh, during the war. Uh, indeed, uh, Brandenburg's experience was so bad that within a decade of, of the end of the Thirty Years' War, the electors of Brandenburg were beginning to build what was at least to become, and it would have taken time, the archetype for all uh, professional armies. The Prussian one uh, just recently made a video about uh, Charles X, um, uh, uh, King of Sweden, his invasion of Poland and Denmark. We've seen the role of Brandenburg there was uh, still quite subordinate to the one of Sweden, and that, however, was beginning to be a bit more aggressive depending on, on the situation. But again, these are things that take time, take a specific choice. By the way, it's not, again, a just natural process. Of course, humans learn, adapt. The changes may seem sufficiently slow, um, you know, ineffective, inefficient for a while. But you must always take into account the enormous friction that exists behind this politically 
socially? Who does pay for bringing these troops on the field? What kind of general awareness is there about the necessity of this war, which naturally when there are greater powers around you starts emerging, uh, evidently you need a, a powerful military uh, that will be able at some point not just to defend but also to offend because it's important to seize opportunities also for those countries that cannot do it by themselves. Um, so everything, and, and again Europe is also by the way a, a continent that has... Um, a great advancement, a great level of political fragmentation uh, overall. Um, and, and so what you see is, is a very strong, quick update, civilizationally speaking, at this point. But still, compared to one another, very often there could be such um, important differences, given, again, the, how close these powers were to one another, how dangerous they were for one another. Um, and the mantis of still is the fear of being overrun by the enemy um, was what triggering, right? Very often in this sense, sort of negative way, not because of a positive uh, enlightenment, you know, uh, the uh, this this military uh, built up, let's, let's call them better. So merely forming an army into regiments was not a, an automatic guarantee of success either. Again, this is the point we can do over and over. There were less updated armies that at some point were more successful because, again, there are many other factors, um, primarily moral forces, but just how what, what's the strategic situation, uh, what, I don't know, battling supplies or whatever. So, um, the in fact, the, the troops had to be fed, sheltered, clothed, equipped, maintained in the field generally, right? Prior to the Swedish intervention in the Thirty Years' War in Germany, the most efficiently organized army was indeed the, the Spanish one. Um, the Dutch could be counted a good second. We have seen this in uh, at least in insight. It, it depends on which factors you're you're considering. Overall, at least that there is, especially a, a fast Dutch growth, right? The Dutch uh, emerged as uh, well. Of course, they were already as rebels in the in the late 16th century, fighting for their for independence from from the Habsburgs. Uh, but they there are also some of the people here that are growing the most, just as a, as a power in terms of built up. Uh, and, and also in quality, right? In the second half of the 17th century, the Dutch army, especially from a from a financial point of view, was one of the best managed, and that's also, in fact, um, one of the most important aspects of this. And consider that at that point, they had to literally the word the, the midget they had to defend from neighboring the neighboring giant of France, and so they necessarily had to have the the best army, just like. Uh, fighting against the Spanish had been a, a great challenge. That's why you, you have such development uh, overall. Um, the um, the Spanish, so in here without counting the Swedes, by the way, they're coming to play. And, and generally speaking, you know, the 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 forces, like if you pick the the balloons, the, you know, the, the, they normally had, the, the, that era in general, had never been quite militarized, per se. They had actually some of the lowest quality uh, in, in warfare. Um, but th that, that's how fast, right, uh, things can change when you have a specific reason. Yeah. Uh, as we said before, the Spanish were able to lavishly supply their troops with clothing, food, arms, and, and other equipment virtually at will, meaning that, of course, nothing was infinite, uh, and that, in fact, also Spain, with her tremendous revenues from Peruvian silver mines, could not foot the bills for the larger and larger armies required. As a matter of fact, again, there was the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War going on at the same time, uh, for Spain, it was really demanding to handle all this, and don't think that just having a lot of precious metal actually solves financial problems, just per se. Um, virtually does, but there are also many other dynamics internally and, uh, say, on the international market that 
um, are much more, make things much more complicated for Spain than, than it seemed. Right? It was definitely still a very great effort. In any case, the Spanish crown revenues at a point were not sufficient, just per se. Um, this explains, in a way, among the other, um, you know, here we're talking complex theaters, or also politically speaking, but when you realize the, the, of the rise of mercenary companies, like the one of a man like Wallenstein, about which I made a video, uh, and that we'll have to talk about, hopefully again soon, you, you can picture, in a sense, the failure, at least in a, for, for how it, it was already failing at that, but in this sense coming to be ever more uh, challenged by the, the necessities of, of this war, of unprecedented d destruction level, um, of the, say, the, in fact, national powers, right? You, you would argue that, you know, the, the best valley in the world, it's, it's a concept I never liked. I don't think there was ever a, a uh, pre and post Westphalian world. I mean, there was, if you understand Westphalia, just for what it was, right, uh, as a peace treaty, etc. But um, there was nothing radically or categorically uh, different, right? This, certain changes are all. People often tell me, ah, oh, but I see a resemblance of, I don't know, in the war in Ukraine with the 30 years war. I, I, because I, I heard that guy, I don't know, what if Altest. Uh, Talk, saying this and then making me realize suddenly was at uh, um, look I, I don't want to brag as usual but I'm a PhD in 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 military history because that's at the end of the day what I do as over uh, medieval history and, and already the concept of listening to somebody like what if Aeltis or whatever it's called just conceptually is is wrong by definition I mean we live in a world here aside from this example that literally thinks that there is something to the concept of geopolitics as such. Uh, and they don't understand even what I'm talking about as an implication. And it's ab absolutely normal, right? Uh, if you have never heard of that before, you never pose yourself questions, or if you need the research... The stra in fact, that's the trap in which people normally fall in. The, the sense that um, there are parallelisms that you can trace with the past. Why, why don't you spend time studying the past instead of trying to find parallelism. That's what people who do not know the past do. With incredibly superficial, shallow, uh, unfactual, and, uh, you know, basically uh, just senseless, meaningless um, analysis of different things. Um, I mean, with all, just banally, just from a dialectical point of view, with all what happened uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the end of the Thirty Years' War, to say today or whatever people say we don't live in a in a post westphalian time anymore w with all the things that happen in between including two world wars or more why do you even feel the need to categorize the world as a post westphalian thing right it doesn't matter how important the 30 years war was but it's at the end of the day still a you know a 17th century war that the lots of more important things happen afterwards, and still, in terms of models of government, of politics, the, the mere fact that somebody thinks that there was a, a, a post westphalian world in a sort of a rigidly, categorically standardized world of identities attached to countries, etc., is, is quite disturbing. It's anti Clausewitzian by definition. It doesn't properly take in consideration what war practically is. Right now, the events of Wallenstein, we will talk specifically better in another in our circumstance but it, it, I think they show they exemplify what after all a functional system um, can achieve uh, in terms or even just through private means that are still however subsidized by states in creating something that could establish a sort of maybe not say, durable political territorial reality, but still orienting, for example, German policy towards that direction rather than another, right? And why, what these people did and why, and why eventually Wallenstein was taken out, what were the, you know, the relations with Ferdinand III, etc. Well, those are, 
things that you must appreciate, even in, in our own world, way before. Like, th there's never been a time in history in which there was no force that was greater than one of governments as such. Right? If you, if you know politics, you, you cannot consider yourself literate in it if you presume that there is just a unitary, hardcore identity of a country out of which nothing exists. That's, that's actually a fruit of human degeneration. It's a fruit of sin, of the decay, the, the cultural, mental, personal um, decay of, of the individual's dignity to cheapen reality to that point. And it's incredibly, you know, um, some people said, oh, you, you should make more videos about this because, you know, you're better as a public intellectual. I'm not an intellectual, right? Then, then they say, uh, as a historian, I am a historian. And that, well, that can be intellectual as well, by the way. Um, but um, it, it's, it, it takes, believe me, I'm very few to study history um, in order to understand how any kind of bigger picture explanation, categorization, paternization of reality without an actual measurement of every single situation as a consequence actually make any sense. One thing is archetypes. But then there is the declination of this in reality and politics and, and warfare and society. I mean, by definition, if you are aware of any of their complexity, they don't fit this BS, right? And and they never will. And it will always be easy to make money out of gullible people because they are gullible people and they should be responsible for themselves, but they aren't, right? Uh, so Wallenstein was willing to spend his considerable personal fortune in the Holy Roman Emperor's interest in return for honors and distinction. And this is essentially not different uh, from what normal colonels, normal regiment uh, commanders were subcontracted their, their administration. And sometimes, like Wallenstein did, did take part in the war as a, as a commander, which is often, like they say, were two separated things. Yes, at, at a, to some degree, but not always, right? Very often, were same people who had always been managing warfare. They were into just warfare because they were noblemen, aristocrats. It was sort of a duty at the time. It was still so readily evident. Try to 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 mix that with the concept of a of a post-Westphalian world, right? Look at the video I made about Maurice de Saxe. And try to to fit Maurice de Saxe in a post-Westphalian war, right? A, a most glorious Protestant commander, uh, half German, half Swedish, in command in commanded most Catholic French royal army forces. First fighting together with the Allies against France, and then with France against the Allies, learning from from a mentor that literally signed himself with an Italian, German, and French name you know, the signature, um, and talk about post-Westphalian. It, it's, you know, it's self-explanatory, right? And the point I was making, again, is that every... I made a video about, I think, al the the Spanish rogue, uh, that uh, explains this, like, what the, the sheer misery and the, the, the word of expedience, and also the, the human mobility, by the way, is always overlooked behind... The um, the maintenance the, the contracts of the uh, of the these regiments and the the noblemen who were behind that and the the, the general mechanism that made everything work uh, it's a constant um, you don't see any unity I mean you see the the struggles of these people that hand their values that their identity no doubt about that. But there is always a hierarchy like that that very often is not depicted, again, if not in this sort of modernistic uh, term. But uh, that are um, still essentially trying to, to survive by themselves, right, in this world and making that fear of surplus that is able to oil the, the great bureaucrat in, in that state, etc., to, to give you more commissions and then has you have very few to and uh, you have attendants that work for nothing just behind uh, for for this guy in, in the expectation of some sort of fortune from inside but it's a world of misery 
rate, the growth rates um, to which we are habituated even in time of relative stagnation, that these people didn't even know what they were, right? It was an incredibly miserable world compared to our own, materially. And morally, one could say otherwise, because they really lived in a much more intense way than we did. Exactly, but because of this pain. Uh, and in fact, the shortage of money could not be viewed as an entirely negative matter itself. To, to be sure, mercenaries with arrears of pay were likely to march off. But national troops that, after all, were very often more directly involved in the issue, right, and had houses at home to defend, even just in the expectation, even maybe in an aggressive war, right, this, this myth that, again, ah, oh, the terrible people that uh, invade our countries. Well, there can be ways of it. I'm absolutely not referring to Ukraine because there, there is a, a way to, to be right or wrong about a war. Um, but I, I mean, that ipso facto, anybody who invades another, any other country in the entire history of mankind is, is negative. And these poor people that want just peace and, and war is not um, on them, you know, they just want everything to end because they're such deeply mature pure, great people, right? And the rulers are the terrible, corrupt, evil leaders. Again, this is this is the religion of lesser people that, in fact, is shared by the majority of the population today with the obvious logical consequence of the identification with the same. And that has nothing to do with the ambitions that a country has to expand, to conquer, right? Because who gives way on, from the other side gives way and the world is not isolated. Like like this this um, this this theater is not isolated. The world is watching, and they and it pours in forces, right? Supports other countries, etc. So, actually, um, it's even more evident to a national trooper how important it is actually to fight in this war after all, right? They would try to tend to hang on, and if the arrears were great enough, say two or three or or four years worth, the troops would hang on for sheer desperation at times to get their money. Because this is also the same money that goes to, to the people that they are defending. And of course, it's still a miserable amount. But, again, the rewards of a successful war, and so also depending on how you fight in the same war, are something you do not want to disregard. In case, why do people fight wars and, and what for in general? Now, of course, this also, um, if you look at the 30 years war, led to massive immunities because if a system goes bankrupt and normally this, all these powers were chronically short of money, um, there would be a sort of breaking point through, um, you would say, mutiny. Uh, it sounds more like a strike, right, to, to use a better word. Um, Spanish troops were particularly prone to this, right? First of all, first of all the Tercio had a, an enormous sense of themselves. Allegedly, they didn't have even a, a disciplinary regulation because everybody was a volunteer, and the mere fact of abandoning the Tercio would have destroyed your reputation anyway, so that they didn't even need to punish allegedly the deserters. It's not entirely absolutely true, but... Um, they had su such a great sense of themselves and the superiority of the Spanish arms that um, mutiny had become almost institutionalized among uh, Spanish troops. There were elected officials, formal regulations, traditional ceremonies, and even forms of address, all of which were even more or less officially recognized by the Spanish crown. Um, so this tells you how important the military was, also from a political point of view. And eventually, the troops would get paid in some way. They just wanted some cash from time to time to keep body and soul together, fundamentally, because in, in great part, that uh, short amount was what it was needed for them to literally survive during the war, to eat, to clothe themselves. Um, again, standardization is something that kicks in, in, say, the way we conventionally mean in a modernistic sense, exactly during the Thirty Years' War, but... Um, again, the uh, as we were saying before, just um, issuing a collar that for your uniform by just being given the the the, the white cloth, and then you you should have had it dyed by someone, or uh, or maybe just 
the cloth being made in any case by somebody else, uh, just by by a tailor, because they just gave you the cloth. And this is how, again, in medieval or ancient times, it had always been the case with uniforms that, of course, had already existed before this time. Um, but um, very often, you this, this thing just melted away on campaign, and you had to survive, you know, where or another. You had to, in fact, carry out even things, as we will see now, that are somehow morally reprehensible. But are part of this incredibly strained balance that is always creating crisis after crisis, pain after pain, sufferance after sufferance. Um, uh, there was, in fact, a more sinister side to the money problem. If, for example, Spain couldn't keep her money moving fast enough to pay the troops, neither could anyone else. Have you ever considered this? I mean, in practical terms, this mean, means that although the monarchs were actually okay with making peace already after 1644, no one could do so safely. Why? Because the troops had to be paid in order to discharge them, and no one had the money to do so, uh, as there were literally hundreds of thousands of troops in service. These were all people who could m mutiny and cause a revolution of some sort, right? And consider that things like this did happen. Think about the front in Paris. Um, there was always, again, it was never just the troops per se, but um, say this militaristic issue, especially of Again, this was also unprecedented. The amount of troops that were uh, essentially armed had never eventually been discharged into the world. A world that had still to settle, by the way, confessional issues again. post was fine in the world. Uh, you know, the Edict of Nantes continued to be an issue. Think about France, think about other countries, think about, you know, uh, Britain, um, the confessional tensions, etc. So... Uh, it, it's all extremely complicated by by the circumstances. The same creation of permanent barracks, for example, the think about the Hotel des, des Invalides, or uh, the, the problem of building troops again, even at home in peacetime. Uh, that kind of world had all yet to be built, right? And there were some military changes that, for example, go beyond but set a model even after Westphalen, but for another reason uh, other than that, right? Just the, the, the universal needs for this kind of development. That's why I don't like the categorism of before Westphalen or after Westphalen. Because what France did there, uh, something that broke with the entire so, so even before, right, by paying the Protestants, for example, against the Habsburg, that had always existed in the 16th century with the uh, French-Ottoman alliance, etc. So, again, let's not be so uh, sure, right, that a post-Vespalian world is exactly what we mean, especially in a sort of identitary homogenization of single statual realities. That's not actually the most important thing. There is surely a post westphalian world in much more interesting ways. Uh, in fact, universally, right, in international regulations, etc. In a way, the same war was fought, but again, on a, on a uh, path that must be observed in all the various steps not just into watersheds that do not make much sense. Uh, in any case, the war dragged on, bloodily, by the way, from 1644 for another four years, because, again, uh, there were no money available to pay the troops that were still on the field. Anything would just be gradually conferred, and, you know, so these forces were spent in other ways, further, so it was incredibly, also, you think about all the people who died in the process, people you never even hear the name of, right, there are even some commanders we've seen it, for example, in the Battle of Freiburg, um, 44, exactly, well, when you, when you look at that, um, even some 
officers, so you realize the kind of life they had, only when you understand how related were with the army, with the government, why did they choose that path, etc. And, and, and you realize there was a coherence, by the way, behind all this. The way of addressing it today is very often, ah, oh, look at how many people died for nothing. This is, again, a problem that the Fort Estate thinks like. It, it's something just from the 20th century, before it did not exist, because uh, those people didn't even legitimately have a place where to voice, to, to be heard, right? There's too much noise uh, nowadays. So... The, the devastations as well, I mean the shortage of money coupled with extensive damage to the countries caused by the war, Germany again lost something like one-third of its population during the Thirty Years' War. And Germany was a, a big country, by the way, importantly populated, right? So it, um, you know, it took really these armies to, to suck it dry in order to achieve such monstrous uh, result. I always advise to read uh, ad, um, Simplicius Simplicissimus by von Grimmelshausen because it's uh, like one like it opens your eyes on what Germany actually was during the Thirty Years War. And again it's a world that we have unfortunately uh, erased in many ways uh, Culturally, at some points, even even ethnically, I mean, just if you look at the, the map uh, of Europe uh, in the last uh, hundred years, uh, brutally enough, by the way, and uh, there was a war before that, right? As, as much as there was also a war before the Thirty Years' War, indeed. In that sense, you can see Westphalianism as a as an idea so um this had obviously occurred because of how much the armies had crossed back and forth the country I mean turning into semi independent entities that's why you realize also how messy really we were talking about it yesterday even just for uh, a much more advanced time like i don't know the, the american civil war right we think it was an overall strategy comprehensive well very often generals were out there leading campaigns but in their own theater a bit like they wanted. You can imagine in, in 17th century Europe with this degree of constant uh, negotiation, fragmentation, chronic lack of money, etc. in systems that work in a much kind of more rudimentary and primitive way the ones of 200 years later with the telegraph and um, railroads, right? You know, it had been that messed up still in the 19th century. You may imagine 200 years before, right? So uh, armies during the Thirty Years' War moved um, partially to be able to eat, which is fascinating in a, in a way because uh, we are somehow more habituated to even just 18th century warfare where... You have essentially a, a train that starts developing ever more to supply the armies in an ever more functional way. Then you have in the Napoleonic War we exploited, uh, explained it countless times, the fact that armies would essentially uh, just be always on, on the march day after day because they couldn't stay literally more uh, than, than a couple of days in the same place without l literally eating everything was there to the point that these armies were so large it didn't even make sense to to create a to, to maintain a supply train if not for the essentials like artillery horses or something like that to replace them um, and they would simply however march it was a more modern way of, of, of dealing with this but with what was happening in the 30 years war everything was much more artisanal we can say you know everything was just to move this castle this town Think of the literally hundreds of German states that exist. So places you just march in, they don't have... Of course, they're going to to, to be in league with somebody else. They're going to be politically connected. But it, it's it's a big, wild, um, heraldic uh, forest where 
you get in. And it's also part of the reason why Germany and all of this managed to maintain fundamentally its own um, independence. Because even trying to conquer a place like this, unless it was a bit the richer Rhineland or, or southern Germany that were in fact to be defended at some point, what would have been the point even of, again, of doing anything but exploiting this place? Right. It was an idea that it a bit conflicts with the in fact opposite stereotype that developed later in the nineteenth to the twentieth century, that after the thirty years war, that the Germans were essentially a, a meek people. That they were essentially just easily tameable. Because they were not warlike at all. Um it's a bit like I don't know what the Romans thought when they conquered Western Germany and they had conquered very easily, and, and, and they believed the same thing until Teutoburg happened. So you understand also how cultural perceptions happen for, like, backs and forwards, and how, of course, there is no such thing like a, mo a greater or lesser um, war likeness at this point that it makes the thing. It's just, in, in terms of units, what matters is experience, training, and in that sense also where does the country come from with that. You can have advanced um, countries that are somehow spent morally. You can have others that are still rising, but they're, they still have shortcomings. Everything is incredibly complicated to stereotype that easily culture. There are lots of shots, let's say, lots of countries at some point rise, but also that if you look at in the history of mankind, stay up forever for an ever shorter period of time. It's also true that the world is complex, more complex, larger, there are greater forces, but in a way, uh, the past was not less complicated uh, after all. So there is a great traditional point you could make about this uh, decay. Uh, of course, there was another interesting, almost demographic problem of the armies, meaning not much the impact that they would have at home for the levy, etc. But the fact that when they marched across territory, they grew. And especially in war zones, because, um, first of all, just as a basic army, uh, for each combatant, right, there was usually one, two, or even three non-combatants. Camp followers, prostitutes, uh, servants, disabled veterans, right, have you ever thought about this? Like all the people, especially with all these wars and this high degree of militarization intended, at least in the degree of people who experienced warfare, violence, etc. The, the the amount of cripples, like the amount of people without limbs that couldn't walk. I mean, all the the worst, terrible kind of. This would was less if you think about now, also uh, epidemics, etc. But these people were disabled at some point for good, right? And couldn't quite be, also from a mental point of view, to be reinstated in society because they had seen things that, at that point, you're, you're done for if you don't have, especially, a, some sort of background of that, like, the nobility that is indoctrinated since birth into the thing that must command, they must conquer, they must uh, really be able to, to be that rigid and that stern, etc., uh, it, very much it is true still today. If you look at some damage done by military experience, you realize that lots of people very often join the army without any background, M morally, culturally, personally, and then they complain because they were fucked up before they went to war, and then they're they're even more fucked up after that. You know, that's a very important issue, right? Uh, uh, you have to be a balanced person to even hope in order to... Um, to cope with a war functionally, right? And this often is skipped, psychologically speaking, but you have to send people in the meat grinder anyway at some point. So this is what uh, presents also a cultural plague sometimes. Like even in very present times, you look at certain forms of, even of extra abuse of trauma, etc., you realize that very often certain armies suck because they don't have a sense of the moral drive that should exist in the, the f formative process. But you could find people like, I don't know, astrologers. For, for example, in the video about uh, Wallenstein, I highlighted very much uh, his interest in astrology 
in alchemy, uh, in uh, you know the sort of uh, in fact occult, occult at that point view of tradition that in part was marching a bit in an anti-Catholic direction, sometimes just in an anti-Christian direction, sometimes actually in the right sense even. Um, but uh, physicians, well, this is an age in which, yes, things are modernizing, but if you look especially at the 16th century, you say a physician normally is, as a medic is also, a, as a doctor, is also, a, is also an alchemist. He's also uh, a literate of some other kind. He's also an astrologer. Again, it's it's all mixed because they had an holistic, um, hermetic sense of reality. They 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 are aware of the forces that reality uh, contains in a much more spiritual sense than the materialistic one that eventually affirmed itself in in the field of science, ruining it. By the way. You have pawnbrokers, of course, because, again, uh, think how gamble, for example, was widespread. People got addicted to it um, in the... Think about all the anxiety that existed between a fight and the other, the, the boredom sometimes. And people would sell literally everything. Because they were just going to die, in a sense. So they was not really the worst that could happen to them. And the sense, the taste for gamble is specific uh, to the military, because if you are there to do what you do as a soldier, you you must love gamble, you must love chance, right? And very often you're just forced to be there, at least, you know, or you don't have many other options in the first place. Because being a soldier was not necessarily a worse ex experience than being an average peasant, right? There were clergymen. Uh, chaplains, like people that uh, just plain displaced persons, refugees. I mean, they these armies destroy a place. And then very often, I don't know, people who survived, in spite of all, didn't have anyone else who could they, they could take food from, and they would often follow the same armies that had, say, burnt their families alive, including women and children. Um, thus, an army of 20,000 may number 40,000 or 50,000 or even 60,000 mouths, let's say, to put it quite eloquently in the terminology of the times, because again, these people needed to be fed. It was like a horde of locusts that, um, in fact, was often unfed or underfed, and it could wreak terrible havoc. In fact, again, it's not just the terrible soldier that arrives and and uh, the the poor peasants are these angels that are martyrs that are massacred, raped, cut to pieces. This all happened on a regular basis, but very often the, the same people did it. I mean, the same peasants were the same mercenaries that joined those armies at the same at some point, but that exploited the the mess that was happening in their counter to loot, pillage um, themselves, to steal, to kill. Because we would check that, we would control that. There was not a cadastre, there was no way to, to earn passports. Uh, I mean, you have an idea of what this world was right. You know, it, 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 it was a terrifying experience. And when you look at the sack of Magdeburg, for example, you definitely realize it was carried out by hungry, enraged troops, as many other mass massacres. What is interesting about the Catholic sack of the Protestant Magdeburg, it was full of Protestants in in the Catholic army that committed some of the worst atrocities, as it always happened. Like you know, the sack of Rome in 1527. And yes, there were the the Lutheran Landsknechts that were not exactly people provided with, you know, uh, what you call like sensitivity towards human life. But uh, it seemingly the worst things were carried out by the Spanish Catholics, um, which is horrifying enough. And that was, in fact, one of the most uh, shameful chapters in the history of the entire mankind, way before many other massacres that we point out uh, to uh, on a regular basis. Um, so linked to hunger, often caused by it, was disease. And the health, the, the health conditions were, were appalling, just in normal life. I mean, 
there were no sewers, in, even in great cities, you drank from rivers where they threw bodies normally from brawls, from assassinations, from any kind of revenge. Uh, they, you lived promiscuously together with rats, other animals, other people, uh, with all the kind of disease. So very often, of course, the, the fort estate was just um, decimated, more like. Right, uh, there are many episodes of great monarchs killed by infectious diseases, but generally speaking, they, even if they met with a lot of people, these were just separated from the masses. They lived in palaces. They had, um, like, uh, th they were better fed. By the way, they had better immunitary defense. Uh, and, um, but again, it was a pretty miserable world, even for the, the elite. In this sense, medical knowledge was what it was. Really, most casualties in wartime were the result of illness rather than combat. Famously enough, life itself was dangerous. Like that's yet another concept that is not properly understood when you look at this kind of history. Like we, these people had a completely different sense of, of risk, of the value of life and death, uh, the way you would die too, and it just. The, the level of pressure they had on a regular basis. Um, so th it, it was a far more dangerous life than we can even imagine today. Um, it was a world without adequate understanding of physiology, without antisepsis, without anesthesia. Yet people did this. Again, even sovereigns, you, you had operations without essentially much of a relief. And there were people who were that tough to actually re resist, not even shouting during during this kind of uh, uh, interventions. Many an aged veteran, for example, survived his wounds by concealing them because uh, placing yourself in the hands of a surgeon would not necessarily be uh, a better. Um, a better thing like the this was stamped not from the fact that medicine at the time was completely useless for example orthopedics since ever were dramatically advanced um, everybody knows this but um, the point was again infection so at some point a clean wound especially was better left untended than not because passing from hands to hands um, it would get infected way more easily. And so just think about, you have this, I don't know, massive gap, you know, wounds, oh, your body open up, but if you survive it on your own, uh, together with immense pain, etc., well, that's, you would just um, hide it, right? Um, there was, um, of course, a recognition of the inadequacy of certain medical services, most armies compensated by an oversupply of spiritual comfort as well because at that point it was over so that's the moment in which you start thinking well if it is over I have to entrust myself to someone this is at least the age in mankind in which after uh, Christianity we would do this at least in recognition of what was already the case before that the traditional idea of making it yourself was done so that's the entire meaning of incarnation resurrection uh, etc um, and there is uh, even in the art of the time definitely a sense of that uh, tension right emotionally a sense of um, you know also lack of, of a center because the, the one of arguably perhaps even the largest great uh, tragedy in the history of mankind at least historically can be seen in uh, the the Reformation as such. I mean, that, and all the consequences that it held. But people literally lived in a world without any certainty anymore. And this war was fought basically entirely on that possibility of making it or not again through works. And uh, when you come at the end of your life, which is something so frequent in in this business of war you 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 must uh, 
acknowledge at that point, even as a Catholic, that there are some deeds that are evidently not enough for you. And so that you have to trust, you have to have faith in a way that you, however, can't make the thing happening yourself individually. Uh, this is mm, one, uh, one of the most interesting aspects, I, I would say. Uh, and an infantry regiment could have at most one physician, because they weren't that uh, available. One surgeon and one apothecary. Note that doctors at this time normally didn't touch patients, because it was mostly theoretical work, right? It was surgeons, barbers, etc., that mm, stained their hands with blood. You would have an apothecary. Um, it was almost certain to have a chaplain for each company, plus a regimental one as well. Um, and it, it was better than nothing, indeed. And again, never underestimate the spiritual and traditional meaning of anything. But uh, especially when you look at these pages in history, what they thought it like, what they actually believed. So not what you believe. That objectively nobody cares about, but what they, especially at this point in history, what they they did, uh, and uh, it's somehow way more fascinating and than than you could think if you've never say got into it particularly now. Uh, we uh, will talk again about these topics. These are just little bites, little chunks of such information. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.